Hello and thank you for watching this video. I am Alice Laporta, a research associate in Paleolithic archaeology at the University of Manchester. And today I'm going to present the results of our collaborative project about co-evolution of human hand and stone tool behavior funded by the EK Natural Environmental Research Council. The presentation today is entitled An Experimental Investigation into the Ergonomic Strategies of the Human Hand During Stone Tool Production. One of the main questions in primate and paleolithic archaeology since the first discovery of the Homo habilis hand in Dubai is whether the anatomy and morphology of the human hand developed together with the first production and utilization of stone tool, or whether the hands, the human hands, has developed under other adaptative pressures. However, what makes our hand specifically interested is a complex suite of morphological features that allow our species and very likely other species such as Neanderthal and possibly Homo erectus sensulatu to grip small and large objects with precision and forceful grips like the one you are observing here. Some of these morphological features are the intrinsic hand proportion, which means a longer thumb compared to other fingers with well-developed intrinsic muscle. We also have larger finger pads like tough, shorter phalanges, and the presence of a steloid process on the third metacarpal head right here. And we also observe an asymmetry of our metacarpal head. As you can say, they are looking towards each other. And we also observe a reconstruction of our carpal bones with, for example, the trapezium, amate, and scaphoid bones with different shape. This specific morphology allows three types of grips. The powerful grip or basketball tree grip, where the object is manipulated between the thumb and the other fingers. The squeezy grip, where the fingers hold an object diagonally across the palm, like here. And the forceful precision grip, where an object is stabilized forcefully and precisely between the thumb and the index pad, like here with this shell. The so-called pad-to-pad grips. Now, what has been observed is that other primates like the capuchin monkeys or the chimpanzee in their natural environment can also engage themselves uh, in stone tool behaviors like the one you're observing here. Like these uh, wild monkey, uh, capuchin monkeys in Brazil or the wild chimpanzee, uh, all primates, uh, these ca uh, primates are capable of replicating powerful and precision grip to open nuts or pounding stones, like here. Although the grip that they are using, they lack a degree of control and force. Moreover, primates like these nice capuchin monkeys or chimpanzee, they have been observed pounding the silica rock that they hold on hands, like this one, in order to break them and literally suck the silica out of the rock as part of their complementary diet. Whereas chimpanzee use a block of stone to open nuts, like here. Therefore, the flake and the stone tool produced during this activity, they were completely involuntarily or subproducts. By contrast, fling napping activity, like the one in this picture on the right side, engaged actively and voluntarily merely to produce flakes and stone tools. Testify, therefore, different mental template and cognitive purposes. Moreover, what emerged from the archaeological and fossil record is that around 4 million years ago, hominins gradually were gradually reducing their arboreal locomotion and increasing their manipulative capability associ associated with tool production. Like, likewise, in the archaeological record, there is a sophistication on the trend of stone on lithic technology. Around 3.3 million years ago, we found the first intentional but yet very unstandardized flake production like a Lomeki tree site in Kenya. 
At this, around 2.6 2.5 million years ago, we find the first regular production of stone tool and stone tool shaping with uh, the old famous Olduvayan chopper, like this one in Cadagona site in Ethiopia. And finally, around 1.7, 1.9 million years ago, we finally found in the archaeological record intentionally shaped and bifacially shaped um, stone tools, like the famous Asheulean and Axis. Therefore, the hypothesis we wanted to test is that prolonged biomechanical stress that they were caused by exposed utilization and production of stone tools and the increasing demand of stone tool luckily have adapted and reshaped the, ana the anatomy and functionality of human hands and therefore we were looking for a connection between biomechanical stress stone tool production and hand evolution in order to test this hypothesis, we perform three different sets of controlled experimental, uh, exper archaeological experiment. We replicated five Lomachian flake production sequences, five Olduvayan entire chopper sequences, and five Acheulean and Axis reduction sequences from start to end. The experiment were performed by five different highly skilled flint knappers with 20 years experience and were recorded remotely due to the limitation of COVID-19, unfortunately. The main purpose was to investigate uh, the um, hand grip variability and the ergonomic strategies of the body upper extremity required for the replication of the three different lower paleolithic reduction sequences. For each experiment, as you can see in this video that is playing, we analyze the sequence of tasks needed to undertake and complete the entire, the entire flint napping reduction sequences, following the principle of the ergonomic method that is called hierarchical task analysis. Here, each experiment was divided into tasks defined by the change or stop of specific action and movement. And for each task, for each experiment, the purpose of the task and the duration in, in second were also recorded, as you can see from the hierarchical task analysis diagram. Afterwards, for each task, like this one, for example, which represents a strike task, um, we recorded the type of hand grips employed following previous taxonomy, and we also recorded the biomechanical stresses of the upper body extremity as defined by the ergonomic method, which is called RULA. The ra rapid upper limb assessment or RULA score were calculated, as you can see in this um, in this Excel spreadsheet against each task, considering the inclination, position and angles of several anatomical portion of the upper limbs during the same task. Lower ruler score, such as three or below, uh, indicated low level of musculoskeletal loads of the upper extremities, whereas higher a score like six or seven indicated high levels of biomechanical and musculoskeletal loading of the upper extremities. Our study has identified, identified a total of 13 different hand grips, including six main type and seven different variants, as you can see on the table. Among these, Eight types were previously described in the literature, whereas seven new types were identified by this study, like, for example, the inverted cradle grip or transversal grip or uh, mixed uh, grips. 
Speaking about the results, our results, like here, we have plotted the different hand grip types across the different experiments. Our results clearly uh, show that the Lomachian reduction sequences, both for the dominant and the dominant hand, were the shortest for the number of tasks and recorded, as you can say, see here, the lowest frequencies of hand grips, both in the dominant and non-dominant hand. By contrast, uh, Acheulean reduction sequences were the most complex in terms of number of tasks and, present, and presented the highest hand grip type and frequencies than any other experiment. So that means that the Acheulean experiment recruited many more hand grip types than any others. Moreover, we observed a sequential appearance of hand grip types. The Lomachian experiment required almost one, only one hand grip, the inverted cradle grip, or cradle grip, both by the dominant and non-dominant hand. In the Aldovian experiment, uh, instead appeared for the first time the powerful basketball grip, like the thumb to fingers, and cradle grips which were employed with several variants, as you can see from the graph. By contrast, again, the Sheldon experiment required the recruitment of all previous hand grip types, plus the squeezy grip and transversal grip, which were employed with the soft Amberstone and for the preparation of the striking platform, so the preparation of uh, the platforms required in any um, Acheulean and Dax production. A similar trend was confirmed with the results of the RULA score. The production of the Acheulean experiments, as you can see in this graph, where the RULA score are plotted against the uh, type of experiments, the production of Acheulean indexes required the, required the highest demand of biomechanical loads and effort of the upper body extremity, both for the dominant and non-dominant part and hand. And as you can see, the peak in the RULA score, which are in red, they appear much higher in the Acheulean experiment, but at the same time, they appear much higher during the shrine and trimming the edge task, which confirmed the production uh, complexity also of the Acheulean experiment. In, conclu in conclusion, the results uh, presented in this study only included experiment testing the production of stone tool reduction sequences. Therefore, we acknowledge that other manipulative behavior and selective pressure may have shaped the morphology of the human hand, especially for earlier period, for example, food consumption. Nevertheless, the strong relationship between the higher level of biomechanical effort of the RULA score as quantified in the um, Acheulean experiment um, clearly can suggest that the makers of Acheulean indexes would likely have experienced higher biomechanical effort and than those produced required by the Olduvayan or Lomachian uh, stone tool makers. And that these uh, biomechanical stresses um, before experience during the performance of Schulen experiment had likely reshaped the morphology of the hand of the Schulen and axis makers in confirmation of our hypothesis. To conclude, I would like to thank you very much for watching this video, for your attention, and I would like to acknowledge several collaboration with the expert flint knockers and craft people, and I will happily reply to any of your questions during the live Q&I session at the Exarch 12 conference. And also, I would like to thank the committee 
board and the organizer of the um, conference who uh, have put an incredible effort and work for putting all of us together from all over the different parts of the world under these unlikely circumstances. So thank you very much.